All right, well, who's ready for the word today? All right, open your Bibles to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Picking up in verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, everybody say go, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The title of the message today is The Great Commission. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for today. Lord, we just declare that this is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, I thank you for every single person in this room. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be open and receptive to what your spirit is doing in us and in this church. Father, I pray that you would speak through me today and anoint my words, and that you would anoint every heart to hear your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the Great Commission is, in a lot of ways, the job description of the Christian. And I love the Great Commission because it, it gives us the ability to dream. This is no small vision. They don't just call it the commission. It's the great commission. And Jesus is saying to us, and he's saying to his disciples, go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. Now, back then, they didn't have planes. They didn't have cars. And the apostles that just began to start the church and begin the work of Jesus, it even gave them the ability to dream. That's one thing I like about the Great Commission is it's just a stake in the ground that we're not stopping until this thing's done. We don't get to the point as a church where, oh, we're at 100 people and that's just good. God's capped us at 100. We don't get to the point where we say, okay, we've, we've reached some schools, we've reached the next generation, and, and now we're good, we've, we've checked that box, and, and now we can move on with our lives. It's like, we aren't stopping until the whole world knows about Jesus. And Legacy Hills Church, we will not stop. We did not come just to reach a few people in Lone Tree, we're coming after the city and Colorado and the nation and the world. Now, as God is instituting the Great Commission, the enemy wants to institute the Great Retreat. The Great Retreat. See, God has called us out And the devil just wants to stay in these nice four walls right here. And I'm convinced that the devil isn't so concerned about a church that is attending church as church attenders. I believe that he's afraid of disciples that will go and reach the world around them. See, the devil wants prayer out of schools. And he doesn't just want prayer out of schools. He wants to then get perversion in the schools. See, the enemy wants God out and him in. And we are in a full-blown war. However, I like the first phrase of that, Matthew 28. I have given you all authority. Which means we've got authority to tell every demonic force in this area and in our purview to go in Jesus' name. He has given us all authority. If you didn't listen to the message or you weren't here last week, I I spoke a message called Living in Victory. I'd encourage you to go back and listen to that if you haven't already. But it's all about the victory that Christ has given us. Jesus said to his disciples, I saw Satan fall like lightning. 
And I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, and nothing by any means shall harm you. He has given us the authority. Now, before I get into some of the practicalities of the Great Commission, and, and today I'm going to be I'm going to be very practical. I'm going to be probably uncomfortably practical to you because none of y'all are going to have an excuse not to go do this after this. <laughs> Before I get into that, I want to tell you and just share two things that the enemy wants to bog you down with in order not to follow Jesus in the Great Commission. Number one is inadequacy. Inadequacy. You know, when you're young, the devil will tell you, you're too young to witness for Jesus. Then when you get a little bit older, hey, you're too old. You're not relevant anymore. You can't reach people for Jesus. And then maybe you're a split second just right, but then, oh, it was yesterday, you were just right. So now, now you can't step into this. You know, I hear a lot of times uh, that, that, you know, I really don't have a great testimony. And that couldn't be further from the truth because Jesus has saved you from the fires of hell and you will spend eternity with heaven, in heaven. You know, I hear some people say, well, I don't have much of a testimony. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't smoke crack and my teeth didn't fall out. And, you know, I, I just, I, I didn't have that crazy of a lifestyle. And then I hear some people, they say, you know, I smoked too much crack. <laughs> Nobody ever listened to me because I was so far deep into that world. The enemy will do everything to make you feel like you don't have a story. And you do have a story. He'll bog you down with inadequacies. He'll buy, oh, well, you don't really know scripture or you, you really don't know uh, much of the Bible. You're not a theologian. You, you really couldn't answer all the tough questions. But may I remind you today that the disciples were no scholars before Jesus met them. Three of them were fish, fishermen and Matthew was a tax collector. We don't know a lot about some of the others, but we know they weren't just raised up in this high education. And these men of God shook the world. And I'm just praying that today through these words that God would break off some inadequacy over you. Every part of you feel like, well, I don't know, or I can't do this, or I can't answer this question. No, 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 no. God makes it really, really simple. Jesus came to earth and lived a perfect life. He died for you and he rose again. And anyone that receives him can spend all of eternity in heaven. That's the gospel. If you know that, you know enough to witness and to be a light in your world. You know, it's amazing because some of the the best witnesses are people that just got saved. They, they're just like, they don't know anything, you know? <laughs> they just know that they're saved. <laughs> they just know that, hey, God saved me, and I was, I was dead, but now I'm alive, and they just want to tell everybody about it. But see, then we get in kind of, we get in some religion, we get some legalism, and then, then we start overthinking things, and we feel like, oh, well, may, maybe I don't know this, or maybe I don't know that. Well, here's the thing. You know everything that you need to know to be a light for Christ, Everything. The second thing is that the enemy will bog us down with is timidity. Timidity. Second Timothy chapter one says, for God has not given you a spirit of timidity. Some translations say a spirit of fear. Now, timidity is the force you feel before you witness to others. It's that thing where, oh, I I don't know if I should do that. Or maybe I might lose a friend over this. I, I, I I, I might lose my job over this. It's that spirit that has tried to cut your legs out from under you from advancing the gospel in everywhere you are. It is a spirit. Fear is a spirit. And if you feel something that is not preaching the gospel, I can guarantee you almost 100% that that's timidity. The verse goes on to say, but God 
has given you power, love, and a sound mind. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power and the infilling of the Holy Spirit is, is we need to ask God to fill us up in order to have the boldness to go like Jesus wants us to go. The meaning of, of uh, power, it's, it's almost daring or spunk or temerity. It's guts, it's nerve, it's boldness to be witnesses for Christ. Now, I'm going to get very practical. This is the practical side of this. Because you may just say, you know, I know, Pastor Neil, I know I should be doing this. I know I should be sharing my faith, and I know I should be a light, but but I just don't know how to do it. Well, I'm going to give you three ways, very practical, to reach the lost and be a light in the world. Number one is living the gospel. People are desperately looking for others that are actually living the gospel. Not just saying they're Christians, or not just going to church, but people that are filled, filled with the love and mission of Christ. People are desperately looking for the right thing. And when they're looking for the right thing, they're wanting to see something that is not just words, but actions. One of the best ways you can live out the gospel is just following Jesus and let people watch you. You know, uh, this was over 10 years ago, and I was getting ready to propose to Haley. And uh, so I was getting ready to have the talk and conversation with, with her mom and her dad. And, and so I sat down with them, and uh, I, was, I was full-time uh, at college. I had a couple part-time jobs, and I sat down with them and said, you know, I, I, I want to marry Haley. And, and they had some, some great questions because they were looking at a guy who was a full-time student with a couple part-time jobs. And they wanted to see and know, okay, Neil, what is your plan to provide for the family? And I said, that, that's a wonderful, that is a great question. Now, first of all, guys, I want you to know that I'm going to do every single thing that I can. I will work as much as I need to work in order to make sure that we are in a good place. But I'll also say this, God is our provider. And what we're going to do is we're going to follow Jesus. And they were, just, they were just so great. And over the years, we've had the opportunity just by living out the gospel that we've actually seen family members come to Christ. Now, all glory to God, but in an area and, and for some people in, in our families, they haven't gotten to see that. The Bible says wisdom proves true over time. And, and there's something about people that look at people like you and me. They're like, okay, I know Neil's not that smart. I know, I know Neil and Haley, they just didn't strategize this thing and things are just working out for them. No, no, no. We've done things that look foolish to the world that confound the wise. And then when they look at us, they say, they, they take risk in this area. They, they, left, they left this job to take less money in obedience to Christ. That doesn't make sense. It seems like their finances are in order. It seems like things are working out for them. And over a long period of time, just by living out the gospel, people have been able to watch us live. They've got to see us in trials and difficult times. They've seen us in the darkest times of our life. Say, you know what? It's very, very, very painful and hard, but our trust is in the Lord. A life lived out, and we've made mistakes We've, we've fallen short. There's been so many things that we could have done better. But one thing that we want to make sure people see in our life is that we're following Jesus. And I just want to say this, a life lived out with the gospel, I want to speak to the parents for a second. Don't forget 
your kids. Do not forget about your children. You only have a certain amount of time and a certain window to disciple and raise up your kids. Now, as, as a pastor, I've got to be very, very vigilant not to get so bound up with ministry and needs of the church that I forget my first ministry, and that's Haley. And then I can't forget my second, third, and fourth ministry, and, and that's my three little girls. The Bible says this about training up your children in Deuteronomy. It says, and you must commit yourselves to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat, repeat them again and again to your children. Talking about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, and when you're getting up. Tie them around your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. God is serious about us raising up our children in the Lord. And if you need to make a sacrifice or you need to change a job or you need to look at your schedule and trend some things out, if it means discipling your children, do it. The Bible says, what is it for a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? What is it for you and me to accomplish all kinds of different things, even in a ministry context, even in a business context, to do all kinds of amazing things, and we've done nothing to move the needle for our kids in Christ? I don't think there'd be anything more sad than to look back on the rearview mirror and say, you know what? I could have done a lot more for my kids. And look, shame off you, the best day to start is now. If you've been like, you know what, I'm a new Christian, or maybe I missed it, or my kids, you know, they haven't, you know, I haven't really been pouring into them. And if you don't know, we'd love to get resources in your hands, by the way. But if you're in that place, just jump in. Just start now. Pray with your children before they go to bed at night. When they get a little older, let them stay up a little bit better at night. They, you know, they love staying up late, don't they? And they, and they just start talking later at night. And you may be a little low on sleep, but you may have some, some conversations that save the soul of your child. Do whatever it takes to see your children raised up in the Lord. Also, we want to shine our light at work, whatever occupation you have. See, I'm under the belief that Christians should be the best at what we do. And you're like, well, why is that? Well, we got the Lord, first of all. And he's the creator of all things. He's the wisest. He's in relationship with us. He leads us and he guides us and he anoint, anoints us. You know, Daniel, it says, God put an excellent spirit in him. And if you haven't asked God to put an excellent spirit in you for whatever he's called you to do, whatever occupation is, ask now. Because what happened is, is God put an excellent spirit in Daniel and they wanted to eat all the food and they wanted, wanted to do all different kinds of things. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This guy right here, he stands out. He, he's a cut above the rest. He, he's, he's really uh, fruitful. Look at Joseph. They couldn't stop promoting him. He was interpreting dreams. He, there was something supernatural about him. And when you have God with you, there's something supernatural about, about you. See, God is supernatural. And when someone looks at you and says, man, there's something on him, everything he touches, everything he puts his hands to prosper, they're like, man, we, we, need, to, we need to get this guy in some more authority. And people may ask you, how do you do that? And that is your opportunity. Well, see, my life was a mess. And then I started working here and I got married and I've been going to church. And here's the thing, I just ask God about stuff. When there's something going, going on at work here, you know, I just ask the Lord to give me some wisdom. You know, I'm not shaking and I'm not coming in moody because I meet with the Lord every morning. I read my Bible and God speaks to me. See, at our workplace, you spend 40 hours a week, at least there, we might as well shine our light. And God will shine through you. If we just keep it here and you don't bring it to work, we're not in the Great Commission. And we need to step into the Great Commission. We need to have integrity and character at our jobs. Hey, if somebody else is stealing, that I'm not stealing. This is for the Lord. 
If someone else is in the break room telling dirty jokes, I, I'm, I don't do that. I'm a Christian. I have integrity. I have character. And people will notice, well, he's not participating or she's not participating in all the different things. There's something different about them. And what that does is it creates opportunities for you. Say, this is, this is the difference in my life. This is the difference. Third, we need to serve the advancement of the gospel through the local church. This is for the 99.9% of you that aren't missionaries. You know, I, I was just reminded, I, this one in my notes, but I, I went to a Christian school growing up, and uh, I, was always, I was always scared God was going to send me to Africa. I was like, Lord, you know, it was kind of one of those things, I got saved like every Thursday, you know. It's like, God, I'll do anything you want me to do, but Lord, you know I don't like anacondas. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't, don't send me there. And you know, I, we should be sending missionaries. We should be going after it. But hey, for the, for the average Christian, we move the needle in the local church. We're faithful in the workplace, but we move the needle here. Now, I wanna just be very, very direct and, and even come after some of the consumerism that may be in the room. You know, you should feel some duty to contribute in the local church. If you just are totally okay not serving and it's been years and years and years and you're just totally good with it, something's wrong with that. I love you, but something's wrong with that. You know, my grandma, she, she played the piano or the accordion for, for 45 years, was it? 60? Let's not sell that woman short. Come on, she'll be rolling over in her grave. She served for decades, and I think she missed two or three weekends, and one, she was in a coma. And she was just back next week, wasn't she? She just woke out of that coma, and she just started playing right away, didn't she? You know, guys, we need to get passionate about this. We need to feel some duty to actually do something. It's like, hey, I'm, I'm enlisted in the army of the Lord. If God needs me to do something or hold open a door or whatever it is, I, I'm going to do it. I'm not looking for something flashy. I'm not looking for a platform. I'm not looking for this. Hey, I just, it's my honor to take the trash out for the Lord. See, we can get really, really entitled with our serving with the Lord where it's like, well, you know, that's not really my gifting. Well, your, your gifting is to serve the Lord. That's, that's job number one. And then as you serve the Lord, God will find an opportunity for you to serve in your gifting. But here's the thing, God wants us to know it's not about us and all of our gifts and talents. You know, God, I started, I started serving in kids ministry. And, you know, I, I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't up on the platform speaking. I got picked out of a crowd at Gateway Church and someone said, hey, uh, you, sh you should come serve in kids ministry. And I'm thinking, is there anything else? <laughs> because I had a vision for ministry in my life. I thought, you know, I was maybe going to be on a jet going to, going to Nigeria, doing some crusades in a matter of weeks after getting saved. And, you know, I just, I just started serving. And you know what? It was a sacrifice. And you know what? I was tired. But, but it was for the Lord. I wanted to move the needle. I may not be the person getting the, getting the harvest, but we need to know that, hey, if we just have people on platforms, or see, I wasn't doing this. If we just have people on platforms, who, who's gonna do the, the most important things? See, we've got a setup team that shows up at six in the morning every single Sunday, sacrificing and laying down their life and their sleep to unload trailers and the cold and the snow and all this stuff. And they, they, don't, get, they, don't, they don't get any credit, except for credit I'm giving them right now. And they, they're, they're the kind of guys, they don't even want any credit. Like, hey, don't, I don't want anybody knowing what I'm doing. But you know what? None of this happens. Nobody gets saved. Nobody gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. Nobody gets on a Bible reading plan if the setup team doesn't show up. If they don't show up, we don't get church. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says? It says, hey, don't, don't I look at hand. We're one body. We're all part of the body of Christ. Don't look at, don't have, be an eye and look at the hand and say, no, 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 I'm not really a big fan of hands. No, no, I don't want to ever serve and kill as busy. That's not really, that's not really my gifting. 
You know, I'm not really a kid person. Pastor Haley is our children's pastor. If you want to talk to her after church, she's right here. She'd love some volunteers. <laughs> that was not in my notes, but the unction of the Holy Spirit. Come on, throw your wife a bone, Neil. Come on now. If you are not serving, please serve. My, my expectation, I'll just, I'll just be really, really clear. I, my expectation as a pastor is that unless you're in a major uh, life crisis or there's a major health issue, you should be serving. And I love this city enough to tell you that because there's things we couldn't do if people didn't serve. And there's more we could do if you did serve. See, we're trying to get people out of hell. You know, you think about eternity for a second. You know, you spend a million years in eternity. That's a long time. You've just entered the gate into eternity. And if you know what, you, you opening a door or smiling at somebody or filling up some, I uh, about said coffee. We, we don't have coffee anymore. Sorry about that, guys. But, you know, if you're, 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 you're pouring in some water and it just some way results in one person's eternity, isn't that worth something, don't you think? What better thing could you do than move the needle for the gospel? There's nothing better. We should orient our lives around the Lord. Okay, number two, I'm gonna make this quick. Tell your story. Tell your story. If you gave your life to Jesus and he saved you, guess what? You got a story. You got a story. You know, the thing I love about stories, and Jesus says, hey, go and be my witnesses. No one can argue with your story. You know, there's a lot of arguments going around around the world about, you know, God and religion and all that stuff. But hey, nobody, nobody can, can say, no, 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 that thing with you and Jesus, that didn't happen. You know, we've got billions of people that believe in Jesus that have a story. Well, how do you know God's real? I know him. I talk to him. I have a story. I was here in my life and Jesus came in and now I'm here. Share it. You know, just teeing people up. Hey, Ryan, tell me your story. What, after he tells his story, what's he going to say? What's your story? I'm so glad you asked. Let me tell you about Jesus. Your story is powerful. You know, the Bible says that they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. If you don't think you have a powerful testimony, you just get with Jesus on that and let him sort you out. Because <laughs> he, he shed that precious blood so you can have a testimony. And your, your story is too good not to share it. Number three, we need to have God's heart. We need to have God's heart. You know, one thing I've learned over the years is, is you can't really witness to people that you don't like. <laughs> yeah, as a pastor, there's people I haven't liked. I like all of you, though. Amazing, amazing. Y'all are the best. But see, you can't love people like Jesus if you haven't got his heart for them. We got to ask God for his heart. You know, other than the salvation message and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the most powerful prayer I've ever prayed is God, change my heart. Something in here isn't right, and I need you to do some surgery up in here. And in ministry, God's told me, hey, see, the problem is, is that you don't love those people like you love me. And, and you don't love those people like I love them. See, we can love God, can't we? And we just spend time with him reading the Bible, church, those messages. But, but you know what? You can actually love God and hate people. And we need to get his heart on this. You know, I mentioned earlier, I was uh, in kids ministry and worship team, you can come up. And I started serving in children's ministry. And 
uh, I just, I was happy to serve and I was there. I was first starting studying at King's University and working on my degree there and seminary and all that stuff. And I, uh, I began serving and I just felt a disconnect. I knew that I didn't love those kids like Jesus loved them. There was something off, and I couldn't probably even use this verbiage uh, at, at the time, but I, I knew that I didn't love those people and those kids, and I wasn't responding to those kids like Jesus would respond to those kids. Now, I wasn't hateful. I wasn't mean. I was just trying to serve. But I, I, knew, something was, I knew something was off. And I'm driving home after serving a few weekends. I'm just like, okay, God, th this is for you and I want to do this right. And I said, God, will you, will you give me your heart for those kids? And every week I was in a fifth and sixth grade classroom. Every week we gave an opportunity for kids to receive prayer. And I was the leaders, that, one of the leaders that had the opportunity to pray with with kids up there. And I remember the week after I came back and prayed that prayer to the Lord, there was a kid that came up to me and he wanted prayer because he just found out his parents were getting a divorce. And I prayed for him and I got in my car and I cried the whole way home. Something hit me for that kid that I've never felt before in my life. And it was the love of Jesus. I was never the same after that prayer. All the exterior, all the callousness, all the entitlement in me that really was felt, felt a little bit beyond, be above reaching kids, it was gone. And I wept the whole way home. And I said, God, I can't believe I get to do this. That you would trust me to serve kids with your heart. We were here in August 2022 and we, we, we knew we were coming and we had obedience to, to, to come to Colorado from Texas. That's our story. I remember I was on a walk and God broke my heart for you. And, I, and there was a go in my heart, but I hadn't received God's heart yet. And I couldn't get here fast enough because I wanted to pour out the love of Jesus on this community. See, if, if, you, if you don't love people, you'll never be able to reach people. Don't you think the world needs that? Don't you think the world needs the love of Jesus? See, sometimes we're looking up at the heavens asking Jesus to do something that he's called you to do. Share my heart and share my love for people. I'd love for you to stand with me. And what I felt led to do is just to have a time of prayer because I believe that God is going to change some hearts in this room. There's people in this room that have had a life of disappointment, a life of rejection, terrible family relationships. And if you're honest, if you were honest just with you and the Lord, you'd say, my heart has hardened towards people. If you're in that place, Jesus is in the room and he can put some heart surgery on you and change your heart today. See, the Bible says in Isaiah 61 that he has come to bind the brokenhearted. And he wants to heal your heart so you can share, the wor share with the world just how he's changed you. I've asked a few members of our team to come forward at this time. Tracy Delmar, 
Jono, if you want to come up, we're just going to pray. And I just want to encourage you, whatever posture physically you want to take for this, you can. Some of you may want to raise your hand. Some of you may want to kneel on the ground. Some of you may want to sit down, but get in a posture to receive. And we are going to pray for God to really do something in our hearts. Will you do that with me? We as Legacy Hills represent the body of Christ in this nation. We're a small part. And yet, like Pastor Neil said, we've retreated as a church. And I just feel like we're supposed to spend time repenting as a body, the church, that we have not shown up. We were been apathetic. We've talked about that in this, in this area, this region, that we have been cold. We've shown up and we just, we've, we've come to church, but it's time that we repent because we're all called with a gifting Every one of us has a gifting. Every one of us needs to go and do what God has called us to do. So Lord, this morning in the name of Jesus, we just, we repent as a body. God, we are so sorry that we have not done our part. So Father, we ask you by the blood of Jesus that speaks for us this morning, that you would forgive us. And then allow us, Lord, the humble privilege of stepping out and doing what you've called us to do. Lord, every one of us is called to something. And we just ask you, Lord, to show us what it is. Some of you know. Some of you may not. But, Father, we know that it's written in the books of heaven, and we ask you to make it plain for us. And we just thank you, Lord. And we ask you to use us, Legacy Hills, in this place, in this region of Colorado, Lord. We don't agree with everything that's going on in the government and in our state, but we are here to make a difference. We are going to speak the truth and see lives set free. And so, Lord, we ask you to use us. Legacy Hills Church, in the coming days, Lord, that we have a stake in the ground here, right here in Colorado, in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we ask that you reach from the heavens and touch our hearts, touch our minds, Lord. We ask that you touch our purpose. I pray for the prodigals, the sons and the daughters who have left home. The sons and the daughters who left your presence, Lord. I ask that you return them. <laughs> right now, there are some 20-somethings and 30-somethings in our congregation who need to make a phone call today. reach out to your mom and your dad. Whatever the disparity was, God Almighty can heal it. Make the phone call today. Reach out. Pray for healing. For the single moms in our church. For the single moms in our church. I ask and I empower you to partner with the Holy Spirit in your home and raise your kids. For the men of our church, I ask that you stand up and lead. Lead your house. Lead your house so you can lead this house. We will be known by our faith. We will be known by our testimony. We will be known how we pray. We will be known how we handle our, our stuff. 
Heavenly Father, I ask in your name, know our hearts. Know our hearts in Jesus' name. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for what you've done on the cross. Thank you for your resurrection. Father, we come to you boldly because of Jesus. Your word says that we have a high priest through whom we can come boldly to the throne of grace. And so we come to you boldly, Lord. Your word says over and over and over, do not be afraid. And so God, I ask in the name of Jesus that the people of Legacy Hills Church would step boldly into their communities, step boldly into their family, into their workplace, into their neighborhood to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. So Lord, we claim your word that says that the wicked run away when no one is chasing, but the godly are bold as lions. So God, we pray that the people of Legacy Hills Church would be bold as lions. We claim the power of the Holy Spirit that you promised, Jesus. As you ascended into heaven, you said that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And that power was so that we would be your witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so God, we claim the power of the Holy Spirit. You promised your disciples authority over the power of the enemy so that you can walk on snakes and scorpions and crush them and nothing will injure you. And so we claim that authority in the name of Jesus. God, I ask that you would empower us to step with courage that as you told Jeremiah, do not fear their faces because I have touched your lips and I have put my words on your mouth. And so God, it is not our message. It is not our own place to brag as we share our story. We're not sharing it because of who we are. We share it because of what you have done. And so Holy Spirit, give us your power. Give us the courage to share the name and the truth of Jesus so that families, workplaces, communities, and this nation and world would be changed because we were obedient to step boldly and to share your name, Jesus. We ask this through your power and through the blood of the cross. Amen. Amen. I just want to pray for a group of people right now where you've just been dealing with fear. You've been dealing with fear of man. You've been dealing with anxiety. You've been dealing with mental gymnastics. Just put your hand over your heart right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we rebuke the spirit of fear. Lord, we rebuke everything coming against us that would try and take our boldness, that would try and take our courage, Father. Lord, I just pray right now that you would captivate us, Lord, with your love, that you would captivate us, Lord. Even your your word says that, that, that he who fears has not experienced the perfect love of the Father. Father, I pray that you would overwhelm them with your love. I pray that you would overwhelm them with your mercy. I pray that you would overwhelm them with with every good thing you have for them, Lord. And right now, I pray and commission this community in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we just say there's nothing higher. There's nothing stronger. There's nothing more powerful than the name of Jesus, God. And we worship you today. We send out our worship to the heavens right now in Jesus' name. Let's worship. Worship.